Hey, hello. Today we're going to be a little more comfy and cozy, and I come to you full hormonal breakout and all because we have an important book to talk about today, and that is The Night Ship by Just Kid. If you remember to, I believe, the anticipated books for this month, I was very excited, adamant, eager for the idea of ghosts in this book. And I kind of reassured myself of the existence of ghosts in this book with the fact that there are dual timelines in this book per the blurb, because that's all I was going in with. And Jess Kidd was kind of like, I see what expectations you have. I, I get it, but I'm going to do something different yet again. And you might not get the ghosts that you expect or that I even allude to in this narrative. So for some context, I have read Things in Jars and Himself. So I have not read Mrs. Flood's Last Resort. And Things in Jars and Himself both are very different books, but they both have ghosts in them. And while the ghosts function in much different ways, they are fascinating and intriguing and just the kind of culture and idea of how ghosts are approached in both novels, I really enjoyed as a reader. This book takes those instincts and kind of flips them, it feels like, because this is a much different book yet again than I was anticipating. This is much more straightforward historical fiction, at least in the context of Just Kid it is. There are still these really beautiful moments of kind of the supernatural and the fraying of timelines and the condensing of time in some ways, but it's much more subtle. And to that subtlety, this is a much slower novel, a much more languid novel than I anticipated, and it is laced with a lot of grief. There is a loneliness here, a desolation to a certain extent. And its central mystery works much different than the central mystery in, say, himself or things in jars. And the central mystery has a certain amount of inevitability to it because we are dealing with the sinking, the wreckage of the Batavia. So there is a certain amount of we know how the story ends. The question is, how do we get there? And so the central question of the book is much more reflective and reactionary than, say, the central question in Things in Jars, which still did have a reflectiveness to it, and it definitely had a social commentary, but it also had a much more forward kind of propulsion to what the characters were exploring and searching for on a plot level. And while this is still slower, like I said, the atmosphere is still there. It's a different atmosphere, I would argue, than we got in either Things in Jars or himself, but it still has this distinctness to the language and the use of language and the way the language can elicit emotion, I would argue, and almost the way that the supernatural is written in the empty spaces here. As readers, we really aren't given the comfort of the supernatural. I would argue in some ways, especially in the way Kid approaches it, that would be a relief and a kind of catharsis for us as readers. I know it would have been for me as a reader. Again, because this book is dealing with this loneliness and this grief. And so instead, we are really forced to face the horrors of humanity and reality. And then the ghosts haunt more in their absence because they are mentioned, but they aren't physically present to at least most of my reading. So this novel follows two narratives, which are both technically historical. We've got 1628 with the sailing and subsequent events of the Batavia. And there we are centered on a young girl, Macon, who is sailing to her father after the death of her mother. And in 1989, we are following a young boy, Gil, who is going to this remote fishing island after the death of his mother. And so both are connected by this central starting point of grief and kind of secrets related to that grief and being forced to carry a secret or even just being forced to carry a reality that seems bigger than them and their age because we are dealing with children which I do want to talk about. And so Macon is carrying this secret that her mother died in childbirth because her father was away. Meanwhile, with Gil, we start to learn about his situation and the situation of his mother's death in trickles. But we get a sense from the beginning that there is something deeper going on there that Gil and his mother's life was a little bit uncertain. And there are references made by characters to what Gil did, 
And as readers, we don't know exactly what they're referring to at first. But what we do get from basically the beginning of Gil stepping on this island is this warning not to bleed on the ground, to not give your blood to the earth, basically. And it was a very intentional kind of warning. And I kind of lost track of it, I'm not gonna lie, especially as things kind of progressed because it was a very slow, languid ramp up. And at first I was like, why are we moving so slowly through this? But I think that the atmosphere was very, very important, especially to the last 150 pages where we really got to kind of the emotional crisis point and the emotional crux of the matter. And then once we got there, I started thinking about that blood again. And I was like, okay, Gil bled at some point what was the moment that he bled? Did it start our kind of ramp up? Like what was the correlation here? Because this narrative is kind of deceptive in its slowness. You get caught up in this day to day, in the languidness, and it becomes easy to lose track of these threads that Kid is weaving so expertly. For instance, we get from basically the beginning or close to the beginning, Macon starts kind of exploring the ship and she wants to go to the underworld of the ship. And the world of the ship is very much described in layers and she is of the upper world. And so she connects with this sailor servant on the ship. I am not great with ship terms and he gets her the clothes of a cabin boy, the cook's assistant it ends up being because they have an interaction. And so she starts exploring this underworld as an alter ego. And then later in Gil's portion of the narrative, we see him dressing up in his grandmother's clothes and we see him both getting caught by his grandfather and the way the rest of the very small island that already doesn't really trust him or his grandfather for much different reasons, how they react to that. And so there is a very real societal pressure and judgment and danger for Gil in that reaction. And so it took me going back and just like thinking of the piece as a whole to realize that we had this kind of blurring of the lines with these two characters. I think that that was very intentional to play with them in that way. And it almost kind of like was them reversing on each other and living across time and space in different ways while still inhabiting their own narrative completely and directly. I, having read the blurb, thought that there was going to be some kind of communion between these two characters. There was going to be some kind of comfort and solace in the other that one found with, with the presumption that one was a ghost sue me. But we didn't really get that. We had to live with that sadness and that separation. And so we get these little moments and these details of parallelism between the two narratives and kind of fraying at the edges. We have the nurse in Macon's narrative who is missing two fingers. And then Gil's grandfather is missing two fingers and the way that threads are left. One thing I really loved and hated at the same time, kind of picking up on last week's discussion of House of Hunger and the payoff of threads that were opened or questions that were raised or what have you, Macon and her nurse are playing this game basically to amuse themselves or at least amuse Macon of what happened to the nurse's fingers. And so to every guest that Macon, you know, raises, the nurse is like, oh no, it wasn't that. So as the nurse gets sicker on the sea voyage, she raises this idea at one point that Macon got it right once. And she wants to tell her how she lost her fingers. And Macon is like, absolutely not. If you tell me, you are going to leave me. And so as a reader, I'm like, I really want to know, like, was it one of the guesses that we saw in the narrative? But just kind of leaving that open and that emotional rawness of keeping the question open because if you get an answer, it's the end. And both narratives are dealing with this idea of grief and endings and they start on an end. And then we spiral into kind of what humans are capable of, like I said, and what kind of meanness there is there. We have obviously this wreckage and in the contemporary timeline, we get hints. We know what the end of a lot of those stories in the historical timeline are before we get them. And there is an unquestionable danger there. And it's kind of like the worst of humanity on this deserted island. But in the contemporary timeline, we have this dying community, this ghost town of sorts on this obscure island. And we're dealing with the kind of worst of humanity 
in a way there as well. We've got these bullies on this island. And it would be easy to think of them as kind of oversized characters of bullies, even as I don't think Kid really writes characters. I don't think they're written that way, but I think it would be easy as a reader to try to interpret them that way because it feels safer. And yet I was really struck by how familiar they felt and how I feel like society right now, we are dealing with this idea of the bullies in the public space to a large extent in a lot of ways, which goes back to kind of that tension point between reality and the supernatural, especially as the island has warned Gil of this ghost girl that haunts the island. They call her Little May. And at first, me and all of my optimism was like, there it is, there it is. They're going to engage and interact, but they don't. They are forced to kind of walk their journey alone, except for some moments of this bleed that I think are very important. And I think that the imagery of those moments is gorgeous, but they're at the emotional high points. They're at the crisis points, the climax points. And at these other points where we're kind of dealing with people and humans, we don't get that kind of supernatural bend. And there is a line later in the book where one of the members of the island says, the dead can't hurt you, Gil. It's the living you need to watch out for. And that felt like Kid kind of telling us what the point of those threads were. And so when I talk about like this tension with the evil and the bullies and kind of like the worst of humanity within this kind of context of grief and loneliness and this feeling of being cast adrift and stranded in many ways. And when we go back to that idea of kind of the central question or the kind of propulsion for each character, because I think it is a lot more internal and it is a lot less obvious than in some of the other books. There's not as active a kind of mission for these characters that directly relates to the plot. Rather, I feel it's a lot more symbolic and kind of is a way to keep our characters going. And I think that this is most evident in Macon's kind of search for this mythical monster. And this is an amorphous kind of eel monster, Bullyback, to completely ruin the pronunciation there, I'm sure, that kind of lives in the crags and slips into the shadows and brings out the worst in people. And so it's used very symbolically, obviously, but usually Kid, for me at least a little bit more, feels like she's blurring the lines of mythology and the way that mythology can interact and the supernatural can interact with daily life and illuminate more. But here the children's tales feel much more like children's tales. And I think that there is definitely something to be said about the fact that we are getting both points of view from the eyes of children. And at first I thought, is this going to feel too precocious, especially with Megan? But I think this is a book about kind of growing up and being stripped of innocence. And our characters are already starting having lost their innocence in some way. That journey has been started because they lost their mothers, they lost whatever stability and comfort they had in their lives in whatever way that existed for them. And they are then being forced to face kind of the worst of humanity in many ways in differing degrees and at differing times, obviously. But I think that there's also something very interesting to juxtaposing a tragedy of that caliber with the kind of like everyday cruelties. And so we are looking at a coming of age story, which means that our protagonists are in an in-between. They exist in the in-between, in a liminal space, and they are capable of seeing things differently. So there is an innocence and a way that they are looking at everything with fresh eyes. And from a narrative standpoint, it helps because they don't know as much. They're not seeing all of the adult politics that are going on and playing into things. So in a way, it helps keep us as readers in the dark. It keeps us in the kind of atmosphere of things, the feeling of things, the immediacy of that feeling and that loneliness. Because if we were seeing this from an adult's point of view, we'd have different worries and different responsibilities, and we wouldn't be able to kind of move in and out in the same way. Both Gil and Macon kind of move through their worlds on the outskirts. They're able to slip into the cracks and kind of explore. And along with that in between, we've got this sense of wonder, but also this obsession 
or intrigue with the macabre, especially for Megan on her journey. She loves being told these kind of scary stories out in the middle of the ocean. And we see Gil interacting with the same stories in modern iterations. And we're looking at death and what death means. And these characters are figuring out what death is and what death means and kind of all of these social customs. But as fun as the supernatural is for the adults, I think it's even more immediate for kids. And so in that case, I think it's extra interesting to take these protagonists that are perfectly primed to kind of slip into a world of the supernatural, of myth and legend, and to hold them separate from that, and to make the myth and legend kind of creep in at the corners. But here, for me as a reader, that supernatural definitely felt like it was framed as a coping mechanism for them until we got to the end and we got to see those little blips, those little moments that almost felt like a narrative version of the Northern Lights, where we get this kind of brief wonder amidst the barrenness. So there is a lot of beauty and wonder here, but it is all grounded by grief and violence and really looking at the kind of base nature of humanity in many ways. We are stripping these characters of the social niceties in many ways, and we are focused on protagonists who aren't really sure what those social niceties are yet. They live in that in-between to say it yet again. Speaking of the in-between, again briefly, and something that didn't pay off in the in-between like I thought it was going to, or if it did, I completely missed it, and please let me know. Gil gets a tortoise midway through the narrative, and I am a theater grad, and if you were here with me when I talked about Anatomy by Dana Schwartz, there was a tortoise in that book that because of my love of the play Arcadia by Tom Stoppard, I was able to call a plot point based on that tortoise's existence in the world. I was like, mm, okay, I see where, I think I see where we're going. Here we had a tortoise and we had a split dual timeline narrative. And so I was like, I, I see a tortoise and I see two timelines. I'm seeing echoes of both timelines in the other narrative as we pick off from chapter to chapter. I'm going to see this tortoise. I did not see the tortoise, or at the very least, or most, or I don't know, I didn't see the tortoise in the way that I expected. I expected it to be a lot more central and to really tie our two timelines together a lot more, especially as we reach the climax. So I don't know if the tortoise was an intentional fake out or if it was more just kind of the symbolic nature of how long tortoises live and how this tortoise could connect us to the past or be connecting us to the past in some way. I don't know, but it wasn't as intentional or blunt as I expected. And I guess to that end, this novel is not blunt. It is going to sneak up on you. It is going to settle you in that silence and in that stillness. And then it's going to ramp up and really make you, well, I shouldn't be speaking for you. It may. It may make you question humanity and the nature of people and community and individuals and all of that. But I think the stillness was important for all of that to come to fruition. At first, I thought that maybe we were lingering too long. I was like, why, why are we still Still here. But I do think that that stillness is important and it's also setting up the kind of societal order, especially on the boat. We're getting used to how things did function from the eyes of a child who sees things a lot differently and a lot slower. So we're getting some of what ends up being the more important bits from the periphery as Megan is focused on this adventure. But this adventure and this hunt for this monster also gives her a purpose and it also leads her into contact with a lot of different people on the ship and that becomes important when the order is upset. And so at the end of the day, this was absolutely not the novel I was expecting. And it's that kind of taking a step back and appreciating the beauty of this and what is going on and appreciating the thing for what the thing intends to be and set out to be rather than what I wanted it to be, while also acknowledging the emotional reality of those expectations. So a beautiful novel, a quiet novel, a haunting novel, but not necessarily a haunted novel. So if you've read this, I would be interested for sure to hear your thoughts, both on its own in relation to kids' other work, what have you, but I do think it was beautiful. And I'm only a little mad that I pre-ordered it from my indie 
a week before it came out, only for Barnes & Noble to release a special edition with pretty teal edges. It's fine. But anyway, thanks for hanging out. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Read something good. And yeah, bye.